I'd like to welcome everyone to our Wednesday evening class. David, you don't want anybody to recognize you, huh? <laughs> All right, it's good to have everyone here. We have just a few announcements before we get started, uh, before Michael leads our, our class. Uh, Rick Clay had a carotid artery ultrasound uh, last week and it showed no blockage. Uh, the doctors have diagnosed the cause of his stroke as acute stress. So please keep him in, in your prayers. He has a lot of health issues and uh, definitely needs our prayers. Uh, Marion Hickingbottom uh, was diagnosed with pneumonia uh, today and he's been put on antibiotics. Uh, so remember uh, Marion in your prayers also. He hasn't been able to get out in a while. So we need to remember him. Uh, my mother-in-law, Jane Bonnell, Kara's mother passed away this past week. And we had a, a funeral yesterday up or outside of Fayetteville a little ways. And uh, so uh, keep uh, her dad, especially uh, in your prayers, Wilton Bonnell. Uh, he's uh, taking it pretty hard. They were married for 66 years and uh, she had had uh, dementia for the last two or three years, and uh, he he took care of her in the home until six hours before she died. They moved her to a hospice place, and six hours later she died. So, uh, in some respects, that's good, but he's he's taking it pretty hard. So remember them in your prayers. Uh, also, uh, uh, the family of Loretta Cox, which is Cheryl Schramm's mother. Uh, she passed away this past Sunday, and uh, the funeral will be this week in Virginia. So keep Cheryl and the Shram family in your prayers also. Uh, I mentioned a couple weeks ago about Charles Pittman turning 90 years old. Uh, that reception for his 90th birthday will be in the small fellowship room this coming Saturday and uh, from 2 to 4. So uh, if you have an opportunity to stop in and uh, wish him a a happy 90th birthday. The Southern Christian Home Grocery Truck uh, will be coming uh, to Westside Tuesday, uh, the 22nd. Uh, there are bags at the Welcome Center for you to pick up and to fill with the items and then return them this coming Sunday back here in the back of the foyer. So remember that. That's all the announcements I have. Please be sure and get an announcement sheet back there. There are a few other things that I didn't announce, but uh, please pick that up so you can see what else is going on. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. We're thankful for Michael and his uh, willingness and his ability to, to teach your word. We pray that uh, as we listen in the class, that, that we'll be strengthened and edified in the things that he has to say to us. Father, we pray for those that are, that are ill, Rick Clay and Mary and Hickingbottom and the families that have lost loved ones, my family, uh, for Kara, and also for Cheryl Schramm and the passing of her mother. We pray that you'll bless uh, those families and uh, help them as they go through the process of grieving for the loss. Father, to continue to bless us, be with us uh, as we go about our everyday lives, help us to be the kind of Christians that, that we should be, that that show uh, you uh, through our lives and our actions. It's through your son we pray, amen.
for song uh, 650, uh, Send the Lights, uh, verses 1, 2, and 4, before Michael speaks. There's hope and dreams for the restless waves in the light. Turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1. Last time we began our study in 1 Samuel, and I entitled that study in particular, From the Ash Heap to Hope. And we saw how Hannah progressed uh, as, as the main character of that story, from an from a ash heap type of existence with all the, the uh, conflict, with all the uh, wrangling by her rival, uh, the, the wife of her husband, it's kind of strange to, sound, to say, but the second wife of her husband, and I thought that was interesting how she, how she was so upset that it was so difficult for her, and yet she came to an understanding when she went into the presence of God and she cast her burdens on God. And from that point on, there seemed to be a turning point. One of the things I wanted to look at tonight, and by the way, the, the, the message tonight, the, the lesson, I've called from hope to worship, gratitude, and praise. From the ash heap to hope, and then tonight, hope from hope to worship, gratitude, and praise. One of the main questions I think we need to remember when we read 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel in particular, since this is kind of where we are right now, I think we need to ask ourselves a question and continue to ask the question throughout this study. How should we respond to a caring and holy God? We're going to see how she responds. We're going to see how Eli and his sons respond. We're going to see how the son, Samuel, responds. We're going to see how the nation of Israel responds. We're going to see how the nations other than Israel respond. 
over and over and over again, the writer of Samuel is going to contrast all these ways. God is not going to change throughout the entire series of lessons. But the way people respond to him will change very drastically. And we need to be aware of that. And we need to be looking for uh, this picture. What trust in God really looks like. We're going to see it in Hannah. We're going to see it in Samuel. But we're not going to see it again probably until David. And that may be beyond where we go in this particular series. There are three particular things I want to talk about tonight under the, the title of From Hope to Worship, Gratitude, and Praise, and that's what they are. Worship, Gratitude, and Praise. So let's start with verse 19 of chapter 1. Early the next morning, remember, she had just come from, from God's presence presence. Her countenance was good again. She had cast her burdens on him. She took something to eat. They went to sleep that night, and then early the next morning, they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and then went back to their home in Ramah. Elkanah lay with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. One of the things we find out about Hannah is that she is a worshipful person. She is overflowing with worship to God, whether it is formal or informal. She knows when to put things First things first. And she knows what those first things first are. It's putting God first in your life. Rising up early, the first thing they do is to worship. By the way, verse 19 begins with worship. Verse 28 at the end of this chapter ends with Samuel's worship. That's going to be very important. I'm reminded of Psalm 13. We talked about Hannah's distress last time, and Psalm 13 gives you an insight into somebody else's distress when it starts in verse 1. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will your face Will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? It sounds just like Hannah. And you come down to verse 5 in Psalm 13 and it says, But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation, and I sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. See, she's not conceived yet. She's not had a child yet. And we talked last week and said, I'm not 100% sure if, if Eli said God will grant or God may God grant it. I'm not 100% sure she walked away with the assurance that God was going to answer her, question, or her, her plea exactly the way she wanted it answered. But she had done what she could. She cast her burdens on him, and she could walk away knowing that God is at work in the world. God is at work in the world. Sometimes we fail to understand that. So you go down and you see that Elkina lay with Hannah. And it would not have mattered. But Samuel's book says, but God remembered. Remember twice in last week's lesson, it said that God closed her womb. 
It wouldn't have mattered what they did together, the physical intimacy that they had and shared together. It didn't matter if God was not at work. And here God was at work. And it's not like God forgot and said, oh man, I, I just remembered what I needed to do. God's not like me. I do that all the time. I have to write notes. See, pages, pages of notes. No, I don't use a phone. No, I don't use a reminder. The phone can't remember that many things. So I have them in both, both pockets. I've got things to remind me. God's not like me. It wasn't that God had forgotten. When you hear the phrase, God remembered, it means God's working. It means that God is, is, is building this plan, is, is, is moving this plan along, this purposeful plan that he has for his creation. And he is remembering all the promises he has made. And he is working and working and working to progress that plan. To bring so many things together. To bring people that are, that are loving to him. To bring people that are hating him. And bringing all their actions and their attitudes and their perceptions together. For the good of those who love him. For his good purposes. He remembered and he opened her womb. Why should it be a surprise that Hannah worshipped? Why is it that we fail so many times? And we forget, we forget what all God has remembered. What God has promised. What God continues to do in our lives. And Hannah conceived. She bore fruit. What's our fruit? What is our fruit in our worship to God? She named Samuel, Samuel which means God hears or heard of God. God's listening to me. God may not answer everything exactly like I want it to, but God is listening. God knows. It is not just by coincidence that this is happening. She was not to know that Samuel was destined to be God's spokesman. To a very barren people. An infertile people. But he's going to work. To bring Israel back to fruitfulness. Again. God is a God of his word. Number two. Not just an overflowing worship but an overflowing gratitude. Overflowing gratitude. Verse 21, when the man Elkanah went up to, with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, after the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord and he will be there always. Do what seems best to you, Elkanah, her husband told her. Stay here until you have weaned him. Only make, may the Lord make good his word. And she stayed home and nursed him until he was weaned. Let's stop there. Just a thought. I can't put myself in this woman's place. I just, I, I tried, but I just can't. I don't understand everything. I don't understand about a mother's 
relationship with a child. It's unparalleled. It can't be duplicated. She wanted as much time with him as she could. And she was going to keep him for a little while. Not sure how long he was there. And a lot of people have debated and said, well, he had to be older, maybe in his teens, so he could take care of himself. Not really. Not really at all, because there were many ladies who took care of the tabernacle at that time. And they could have easily cared for the baby or the child for Eli. But here this mother has an attachment to him. And I can't help but think what their conversations were when Samuel was very small. I think about it. I think what she would tell him, she is a person that doesn't hold back, that, that pours her heart out. And she could have easily said something like, Samuel, I have longed for you for so long. I have prayed for you. I love you. And Samuel, I love God. And I've made a promise that if you were in my house, I would give you to him. And I think about that. And then Elkanah comes. Now Elkanah has already said some pretty questionable things in the first lesson. And all of a sudden Elkanah says something that, that I think we need to notice. Verse 23, stay here until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord make good his word. That's kind of quirky, isn't it? I would have thought he would have said, now Hannah, he can stay here until he's weaned, but you keep your promise, you keep your word. I would have expected him to say that, but he doesn't say that. May God establish his word. And I think about what that could mean. I've got two suggestions. You can take either one or both. Or maybe you've got another one that you, have, you, you can think of. First of all, he may have just been saying that the Lord established his word. In that, he meant, Hannah, God's, I, this is going to be tough for you. But God's going to help you follow through with this. And he is going to establish his word. Because when we make a vow to God, and I don't know if I have time tonight to talk about vows. We, we really need to talk about vows. But when we make a vow to God, it's... God's, okay? We've given it to him, and he expects us to fulfill it. And it's not only our word anymore, it's his. It's his, in his domain. That could be one. Hannah, God will help you fulfill this. Another option is this. And I'm drawing from Joshua chapter 23, verse 3. 14. When Joshua looked at the people and said, I want you to remember all the good promises that the Lord has made to the house of Israel. He was, he was pushing them. He was challenging them. And he says, I want you to remember every promise God has made. And I think about how Elkanah could have thought that. At that moment. Why? Because God, the, the Jews at that time lived with a, 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 a clear understanding and, and foundation of their life for this promise that God made to Abraham. And what was it? I will bless you and I will bless the nations because of you. 
and through you. It was God's plan. See, Elkanah knows that God is at work also. He may not know everything about Samuel. He probably doesn't know about what's going to happen to Samuel. But there is one thing he knows. God has made some promises and God's at work. And God is, is, is carrying on this promise. All these promises. And he's bringing them about. And weaving them in history. And Elkanah knew that. And based on those promises, Hannah would be able to follow through. Let me give you one quick, very quick example. We'll come back. If this doesn't make any sense to you, forget I said it. We'll go on. I'm thinking of the Apostle Paul in Acts 22, verse 16. You know, when he's recounting what happened to him, he's talking about Ananias coming to him as Saul. And he says, And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. We have had a, such a problem with this calling on the name of the Lord. That is not difficult to understand. Calling on the name of the Lord simply means, God, I am submitting, I am putting myself under your authority. Your power, your majesty, everything about you, I am under it in submission. And you have told me that certain things are going to happen and by faith, I'm going to believe you. I'm going to grab hold of that commitment and dedication to you because of the promises you've made. Well, what do you mean by that? Do you literally see sins washed away in the baptistry? Do you literally see your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Do you literally see God in you and you in God? No, we don't see it. Only with the eyes of faith can we believe it. And because we believe it, we call on His name at baptism and say every promise that you've made, everything that you've, you've told me would happen, I have faith in you that it is happening. I'm calling on you to make it happen in my life. I'm calling on you to make me a better person. To make me in the image of your son. Maybe Elkanah meant something like that. May God establish his word. May God create in you a woman who will fulfill her vow. So here we are. And we come on down in that particular section. After he's weaned, he took the boy with her, not a baby, a boy, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an epheth of flour and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When they had slaughtered the bull, they brought the boy to Eli, and she said, as surely as I live, my Lord, I'm going to stop there. Just a, just, just a little bit about this. This is, this is just incredible to me. I told you about vows. I've got I've to do this just a little bit. Deuteronomy 23, 21. Deuteronomy 23, 21. If you make a vow to the Lord your God, do not be slow in paying it, for the Lord your God will certainly demand it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. And Ecclesiastes 5, starting in verse 4. Ecclesiastes 5, starting in verse 4. When you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. He has no pleasure in fool, fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin. Verse 7, stand in awe of God. And I think about what those kinds of 
things mean to God. When I'm baptized, I make a vow to God. When I marry, I make a vow to God. When I, when I tell God I'm going to do something, I need to do it. Because I've made a vow to God. But even beyond that, I see her gratitude. Here is a woman who has had years of desperation and trouble. And she is given this child. I don't know how long she has with it. It probably is never going to be enough for her. And yet she is here to fulfill that vow. And she brings this gift. Now... If you look back, and, uh, and don't do this now, just jot it down. Uh, Leviticus 3, uh, Leviticus 7, starting in a verse round of 11 or so. You're going to find something called, called uh, fellowship or peace offerings or thank offerings. And the things that are, are, are required there are asked of the, the recipient there. It is my understanding, I might be wrong, but it is my understanding she goes far beyond the normal requirements of this offering. She is not doing it to meet rules. She's not doing it to check off and say, well, I've, I thanked him. He didn't give me enough time, but I thanked him. She's not doing that at all. She is grateful, and they brought a three-year-old bull, this huge amount of flour. She is ready to show her total dedication to what this vow is requiring of her. It has to be ripping her heart out, and yet she knows this is God, and I can throw my life on Him. I can cast every burden on Him. And he will take care of me. She could have done the minimum. She could have got out with a lot less. But she didn't want to do the minimum. She wanted to go over and above. And then the moment of truth. And that's where we stopped. I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life he shall be given over to the Lord. That word given over is the word lent. And it has no, nothing like the meaning we have today. You lend something, I expect you to give it back. What this means is a total and complete giving with no expectation of return. None. A total dedication, a total commitment. Her for her vow and Samuel for the work of God. I think about what kind of a legacy she passed on here. And I think God has established his word, his promises in this passage. And the question comes to us all, do we? Let me just remind you of a song we sing every so often. You know the words as soon as I start saying them. Oh Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. Be thou forever near me, my master and my friend. I shall not fear the battle if thou art by my side, nor wander from the pathway if thou wilt be my guide. What a promise. What a vow. But are we honoring it? And then like parent, like child... 
and he worshiped the Lord there. I love that. I just love that. There is so much here that screams of train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he won't depart from it. There's just something there that says she made a difference in this child's life. Overflowing worship. Overflowing gratitude. But let's look at the third, verses 1 through 10 of chapter 2, overflowing praise. Every once in a while, this is called Hannah's prayer. And in some versions, it's called Hannah's song. Of course, those are not biblically based. They were just added. I kind of like the song part, but it is a prayer. And regardless, song or prayer, it's a praise to God. You understand very quickly in Hannah's prayer or song, it said she prayed. That her rejoicing is not circumstantial. We talked about this a little bit last time. Romans 8, 28 says, And you know in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. She is understanding that God not only remembered her, she understands that he is establishing his word. And in this song, she is going to say, and God knows. God knows. God is not some kind of crusty guy who's getting senile in his old age. There is nothing hidden, nothing that can be uh, uh, crooked or curved that God does not know. So let's look just a little bit at this, at this uh, prayer. Verses 1 through 2. She says, my heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord, my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one like the Lord, no one beside you. There is no rock like our God over and over and over again. She understands that everything she is, her whole heart, her mouth, her horn, which symbolizes her strength, every bit of her being is because God helped her. And then she looks at God and she says, there's no one, there is absolutely no one with whom I can compare you. And it reminds me, it reminds me of what Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 40, starting in verse 18. Do you remember it? To whom then will we compare God? What image will you compare him to? Do you not know? Have you not heard? Have you not been told from the beginning? Have you not understood since the foundation of the world? He sits above the circle of the earth. And its people are like grasshoppers to him. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He has no competition in this world or in the world beyond. There is no one like him. And if you go back a few verses, in verse 15, we've talked about this when we talked about the Daniel story. Surely the nations are like a drop in the bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they are fine dust. Do you know what this literally means? Surely the nations are like a drop in the bucket. And that's where we get our phrase, by the way. 
not drop, drop in a bucket. But it can actually be translated, drop off the bucket. You know, and, and, and I'm, I'm talking to city dwellers here, so you have to bear with me just a second and go, let me go country for just a second. Going country, I used to, you know, we didn't have, we didn't have those faucets and all those things that you do. You know, you had those pumps that you had to pump the water. And you had to prime the pump to get the water out of the pump. Okay? And then you had to fill the pail. And then you had to walk over. Why couldn't the well be where the cows got watered? I don't know. But you had to walk over there to the trough. I think Dad did that just, just for the fun of it sometimes. But, but I had to walk over there to the trough, and I poured that water out. And I'd let that bu bucket swing, and I'd come back and get some more. And do you know what? There were drops. There were drops that would drop off that bucket. I did not cry one time about that drop falling off that bucket. It was insignificant to me. He doesn't mean that people are insignificant. He doesn't mean that nations are insignificant. He simply means in comparison to God, everything else is insignificant. It, he is incomparable. There is nothing with what or who or whatever you can compare him. And that's what Hannah is saying. That's the kind of God I have. He has all these resources that we talked about last time. He has all these everything at his disposal. He is a God like no other. The only God. Verse 3, do not keep talking so proudly and let your mouth speak so arrogant. Of, of such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows, and by him deeds are weighed. She goes from describing God as this incomparable God, then she turns around and very pointedly says, and do you know what? He's at work. He's at work. She knows it. He's at work in her life. Whether that child came or not, he was at work in her life. And he's at work in our lives. He knows there's nothing to be hidden. You, you can't cover it up. You know, I, I'll, I'll never forget that little, little boy that reminded me of a, another little boy that I saw one time. He had done something that he knew he was not supposed to do. Now, this was just a little bitty boy, but he knew that he was not supposed to have done what he just did. And his mom came into the room, and I was sitting, I, don't, I guess it was a doctor's office or something like that, and he had done something to something, and, and, and the mom went to the bathroom, and she, she came back out. And she said, what in the world? And this is what he did. I wish I could do that. <laughs> you know, every once in a while, I just want to go, oh, here he comes. You know, here, here, here comes God. You know, I've just done something I wasn't supposed to do. I'm going to hide from God until he, he kind of blows over. He's not mad at me or whatever again. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, you can't do that. You can't do that. God knows. And actions are weighed. By him. He is the standard. He is the standard. Do you remember in Daniel chapter 5? We talked that time about Belshazzar. You know, Belshazzar was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. The Nebuchadnezzar was the guy who was driven out into the field and he had, you know, ate grass and all that stuff. God humbled him. And here's his grandson, and he has this, has this huge feast for a thousand of his, of his people. And he brings out the goblets of God from the temple. And he's flaunting them. And he's shaking his fist at God. 
And all of a sudden, this hand starts writing on the wall. And this man, who is his powerful, this man who at his word could have you killed or maimed or whatever, he is reduced to jellyfish. He is so miserably miserable. And his mama comes out and says, you better call Daniel. Because nobody else here can answer this question about what's written on that wall. Finally get Daniel over there. Daniel says, you have not humbled yourself. There's nothing hidden from God. And because you've not humbled yourself, you knew. You knew about your grandfather. You knew about all these things. And you turned your face away from it. And because you've not humbled yourself, God's going to humble you. And you're going to lose your kingdom tonight. And guess what he says in verse 27 of Daniel chapter 5. See if this makes any sense with verse 3 of 1 Samuel 2. God, or, or he says... You have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. God is the God who knows, and by Him, deeds are weighed. He weighed Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, uh, Belshazzar. He was found wanting. There are so many opportunities that God gives us for repentance, for forgiveness. In this prayer, God is a God that shows reversal of fortunes. Just very quickly, verse 5, I mean, excuse me, verse 4, uh, military bows the might of the world, broken. Those who stumble, God will give strength. Verse 5, first part, the hungry are going to be filled and those who are filled will be hungry. The last part of verse 5, women who are barren will have seven children. That's just an idyllic number. The perfect number of children. And those who have children will be in distress. Verse 6. God has control over death and life. He heals, he strengthens, he prolongs, but he also brings to the grave. Verse 7 and 8. Earthly wealth and possessions. The poor he will want... I've got to read this. Verse 8. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. You wondered where I got at from ash heap to hope last time. She was in the ash heap. And God raised her up. But he also humbles those who think they have it all. And then in verse 9 and 10 comes the judgment and the justice of God. Her joy was not, and praise was not circumstantial. God doesn't answer our prayers. God does not do everything we want Him to do. He's bringing all this in His purpose. But God will make a distinction. And he says in verse 9, he's going to protect his faithful ones. He's going to guard their feet. No matter what happens in this life or in our death, we praise him and he will guard us. In fact, in the New Testament, it says you can die and you're alive in his eyes. Because death is not the fi- has, does not have the final word. But in verses 9 and 10, the adversaries of God will be broken to pieces. 
He can bring all the natural forces at his disposal and the heavenly ones also to thwart, repulse, and even kill his enemy. From hope to worship, gratitude, and praise. He wants us to respond to him. So what should our prayer be tonight? Our prayer should be seeking his will in the acknowledgement of our helplessness and committing to Him in prayer, wanting His best. He wants our best. Why can't we want His best? If it's by our life or by our death, if something can happen that He is glorified, that He is magnified, why can't we do that? Why can't we do that? Why can't we truly live for Him? Be the people He wants us to be. Why can't we pray that He enable us to accomplish His will like Jesus did in the garden? Your will be done. Why can't we pray that He enables us, like Hannah, to feel the peace in a world that is raging around us? I remember what Paul said in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. And it's tough, but it's real. And God can do it. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, in prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends everything, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Why can't we find that peace? I'm so glad that we understood God's multifaceted character, His holiness, purity, power, wisdom, justice, sovereignty, providence, all the things that make God God, and He is a God who will reverse fortunes. I've never liked the books that said, and Jesus came and turned the world upside down. I've never liked those titles because it's man who turned the world upside down. It's Jesus who put it right again. And He wants to make you right with Him. And He's offered His Son and He's offered you forgiveness. And I pray that we will start trusting in God before it's everlastingly too late. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this story about Hannah. This story actually about you. You are at work in our world. You remember your promises. You establish those promises. You confirm those promises. And you know there is nothing hidden. So when we are tempted, you understand that and you provide a way out. When other people wrong us, you know that and you will take care of it. You want us to constantly be in worship to you, formally and informally. You want us to constantly have gratitude for the things you provide. And you want us to continually praise you. And Lord, we do that tonight. We lift your name high. And no matter what happens, we want you, not ourselves, to be glorified. Help us to be the people you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.